Should Christians give 10% of their income to their local church? That's what today's video is all about. Stick around. Hey, I'm Tim Kaiser. Welcome to The Prophet Dare. If this is your first time stopping by, thank you so much. And if you've been here before or decided to come back, thanks for returning. If you are a subscriber, blessings to you. So today's video is a continuation of the previous video where we're talking about tithing. What I'm doing is finding videos of other people speaking about this subject and fusing them together. So today I have nine videos that talk about tithing and these are people who do not support the concept of tithing. All of these people do uh, support generous, lavish, fearless generosity just not the tithe. So, without further ado, let's get into the video. Where you tithe mint and dill and cumin. Okay, so first, let's just make sure this is clear. Um, because I, I hear comments like this. Uh, let me just say, you can hear it straight from my mouth. I don't believe that you are required, you, you Christians in the room, I don't believe you are required to give a certain amount of your income. From my study of Scripture, as I look through this, especially when I look at the New Testament, I don't believe that uh, we're, we're required to give this 10%, and so that those who give their 10% go, oh, good, I did it, and those who don't feel guilty all the time. I don't believe that. I don't believe it's commanded, and I don't believe that, uh, that, that we're commanding you to give. Here's, here's what I do believe. Because I hear people say, oh, Francis thinks we should all live in poverty and, and give to those who are in need. And I, you know what? I don't, I don't think you're required to do anything. What I'm saying is the same thing Paul is saying here, is you have this awesome example in Jesus who was rich. Was he pretty well off? He was doing all right in heaven. And what he does is he became poor, made himself nothing, so that we all in this room could be rich, right? I mean, why are you here today? Because someone left all of his riches came down and gave you a pretty awesome life. So he came down and he sacrificed and he made me rich. And so as followers of Christ, all I'm saying is that desire should be in us. That's all I'm saying. It's not a command you got to give. I'm just saying, gosh, doesn't it prove to you that the Holy Spirit really is in your life that you actually have the same desire of Christ? You go, wow, I saw what he did for me. I'd love to empty myself and help these other people. That it's the response of having given your life over to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I think he says it real well. If we go to chapter 9, there's a couple of verses, verse 6 and 7. He says, the point is this. Here's, here's the real point of it. Whoever sows sparingly, that means whoever just gives a little bit, will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, why is it that we stop passing the plate here? It's, it's largely because of a passage like this, where I didn't want anyone feeling guilty and going, oh, there's the plate, the guy next to me, I saw what he put in it. And uh, see, because that's under compulsion, uh, or reluctant, like, I really don't want to give this, but I'm going to look really stupid next to that guy, or my friends are why. I just don't want any of that, because what God is most concerned about is, is the heart. He loves a cheerful giver. So in your heart, it, what, what should happen is have this desire where you're like Jesus. You actually are like Jesus, and thinking, man, I want to help other people, and I couldn't wait to get to church because I thought through what I was going to give, and I get to stick it in that box. It's, it's the, that's, that's all we want. The rest, there's no reward for that anyways. You, you, you want to do it out of love. You want to do it out of joy. And that's the point, is, is to believe not that, ooh, look at what a great person you are. You gave all that money. No, it's more, it's like, no, I'm just being a smart person because what the Bible says, the book that I trust says, if I give, I sow bountifully, I'm going to reap bountifully. That God's, God's going to bless me in this life and in the life to come. And if he gives me more, I get to give more. It's not this health wealth thing where, ooh, he'll give me more and then I can buy my mansion. It's like, wow, I get to be even more of a giver and more of a giver and more of a giver. It's the joy behind it. 
So understand that. And that's why Paul says this isn't about a command. It's not about you better do this or you can go to hell unless you give 10%. No, it's about you giving yourself to the Lord first and saying, I'd like to be like Jesus. Biblical tithing. That's, that is a very good question, and I will give you uh, as concise an answer as I can. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, tithe is a tenth. It's, just a, it's an old word that means one-tenth. In the Old Testament, you had a theocracy, not a democracy, but a theocracy. That is to say, you had the nation of Israel ruled by God who mediated his rule through the priesthood, 24 courses of priests. They were basically the officers of the theocracy. They mediated the rule of God through the revealed law of Moses to the people. <clears throat> and the people needed to supply funding for those officers, the, namely the priests and the Levites who served along with them. Um, so there was a, a tithe tax that was essentially the basic tax to fund the national government. It was one-tenth of whatever it is that you earned. Uh, it could be commodities, uh, not particularly money, grain, oil, fruit, whatever. Um, then you had a second tithe every year, which was designed to fund the national celebrations, the feasts, the festivals, uh, to provide all of that that the nation Israel engaged in, and there were a whole series of feasts, as you know, and uh, funding temple events when the whole of the people came together, like the Passover and all those things. Then you had a third tenth every third year, which was the poor tax that was distributed to the people who were poor. So if you split that into every year, it's about three and a third percent every year. So essentially, every Jew paid 23 and a third percent with the addition of a fixed amount of temple tax, with the addition of they couldn't harvest the corners of their fields that had to be left for profit sharing to let the poor take that. If you dropped a bale off your wagon when you were harvesting, you couldn't pick it up. That again would supply for needy people who would hang around the fields to pick up and glean whatever they could get. So you might say that it could be somewhere between 24 or 25 percent of, of the income of an Israelite living in the kingdom that was funding the national government. That really was taxation. That never was free will giving. That never was what we would call free will. In Malachi 3, when God says, why will you rob me of tithes? That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Free will giving in the Old Testament was whatever you wanted to give. Whatever you wanted to give. You have illustrations of people giving all different kinds of amounts. Um, a tenth of a tenth was given uh, in, in, the, in the Pentateuch. Um, when they built the, the temple, you remember people were told to bring whatever they wanted to bring? And they brought gold, and they brought jewels, and they brought everything, and finally they brought so much that they had to say, stop bringing, we have too much, it's, it's an overload. Um, in the book of Proverbs, it simply says, give the first fruits, doesn't say an amount, um, be generous, etc. So, so you had... The question was, I, I don't want God to be mad at me. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that was, so, that was what she said. I don't want God to be mad at me, um, I want to tithe, and my husband says no. Then don't tithe. It's, I'm saying go to church, even though your husband says no, but he says let's not tithe, don't tithe. Here's the reason why I would separate those very differently. First off, tithing is not required. By, if you, by tithing you mean giving 10% to your local fellowship, like that is a fine rule to follow if you want, and we've always done that, but that is not required. There's no New Testament teaching that's required. How do pastors that are so good at verse-by-verse -verse teaching get yeah. all weird on tithing? <laughs> I don't understand. Um, are we told, however, to, to give and support those who minister to us spiritually? Yes. Is there an amount associated with that? No. Because in the body of Christ, people are in different situations with different amounts of money and all that. So it's just, you give how? Cheerfully. You give according to what you have decided in your own heart. 10% isn't that, unless you've decided that. But no one can dump it on you. Um, so the New Testament text doesn't say that. Um, tithing was for Israel, and they gave to the Levites in the temple. If you really want to tithe, you should give to Israel. <laughs> Um, 
<laughs> giving is something that we should do, right? I, I want to help the poor among us. I want to pay for the people who minister to me. And, and I also wanted to take care of the building. Like, I'm absorbing the AC, and I'm drinking the, the, the liquids, the coffee or whatever they have available for me there. I'm, you know, bringing my kids to be taken care of during the service. So obviously, you're just rude if you're not going to help pitch in. Like, this is, right? <laughs> but if you're poor, by all means, it's the church is blessed that you can come here and not worry about any of that. Mm-hmm. So, so none of those are rules. But... Why I say you shouldn't, even given all that, those are good reasons to give. Um, it's his money too. Right? It's both of your money. It's your money and his money. And scripture says that we should not give by compulsion. And by taking money that's, that's his too and giving it against his will, I'm violating that rule. I would say part of your witness to your husband is do not do this, especially because non-believers will trip out over money issues, especially. Right? It's on their mind more than it's on yours. Yeah. And knowing some of my money's coming from my bank account going to that church, it's, just, it's a scam. They're scamming her. It's all, I would say, um, don't, as part of your evangelical outreach to your spouse, that just don't, right. just don't give. Let the church cover for you. Right. Right? Until you could be of one heart and one mind and you can be agreed on how much you guys give, I think just don't. Not by compulsion, the scripture says. And um, so yeah, be a, be a good witness. Um, will God be mad at you? No, um, I think you honor God by going with your husband's wishes on this particular is- issue. And think of it like Paul. It was, Paul says it was right for him to be paid, but when he went to Corinth, he wouldn't accept any donations. And he worked with his own hands making tents and stuff so he could pay his own way because in that, in that particular culture, he knew it was important for building bridges with the gospel so they would know it wasn't about money. That's how I would view this situation. Yeah. Right. Oh, I appreciate that too about the 10%. It is shocking. Like the, the churches will, will do that. Yeah. And they're like, you got to give 10% to us right. and then you can give to your pair. And I'm like, I don't, no, nah, never really. You can. Yeah. But why do you have to? And if, imagine, let's just pretend for a second that you, you're Elon Musk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you go, and you go to like a, a 50, 60 person church and the pastor's like, you got to give 10%. <laughs> And you're thinking like, I have to give you guys like $23 billion <laughs> this year? Uh, 23, you're going to go insane with that much money. Like, can, can I even, are you even responsible with that much money? So I, I think that right. the percentage thing is fine if you want to do it. And like I said, maybe just out of tradition. We've 10% always hold the phone, Henrietta. Are you certain that you're supposed to be giving 10%? Hey, the Old Testament talks about the tithe. Actually, it doesn't. The Old Testament talks about the tithes. There are multiple tithes. See, it's that Hebrew. <laughs> kind of gets all spitty. There are multiple tithes in the Old Testament, totaling, give or take, at least 23 to 28 percent. So if we want to apply an Old Testament, Old Covenant law for that people at that time, then we better up the ante from 10 to at least 23%. But I don't think that is what God desires in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. When you take a look at the tithes, the poor tithe, the festival tithe, the operating of the temple tithe, which totaled 23, maybe 28%, your money that you were giving were basically your taxes for the operation of the system, for the government, for the nation. That is what the Old Testament ties was. Think Old Testament ties, and I think it's safe to say, just think, well, those are basically the taxes. But what about giving? How much were we supposed to give in the Old Testament? And the answer in the Old is the same as in the New, as much as you want to. Give from the heart, not from compulsion, says Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Give what you desire. Giving has never been an accounting issue. It has always been a heart issue. The question many Christians have is whether we should tithe. And tithing for most people means giving 10%. We'll, we'll return to that uh, question. Uh, the first thing I want to say is good Christians disagree on this. This isn't the clearest thing in, in the scriptures. And maybe the second thing I'd want to say is, it's an important question, but it's not the most important thing. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that we as Christians can disagree on and have good fellowship together uh, if we d- disagree on that uh, matter. I would say, is a tithe required, 10% tithe? I would say no, because the tithe is part 
of the Mosaic Covenant. It's part of the Mosaic Law, the covenant made at Sinai with Moses and with Israel. And the New Testament is very clear. We're not under that covenant any longer. Galatians 3, uh, Romans 7, Hebrews 9 and 10. So there's a lot of texts that indicate we're not under the Mosaic Law. The tithe, the 10% that was given, is actually tied to the tabernacle and the temple, to, to the Levitical priesthood. I mean, where did those tithes go? They went to the temple. They went to the tabernacle. They, they, they went to the priests. Well, we don't have a, a temple or a tabernacle anymore. We don't have Levitical priests or Aaronic priests anymore. Jesus is our great high priest. The, the church of Jesus Christ, we are, we are the temple. So clearly the tithe as part of the Mosaic Covenant, since that covenant has passed away, it's not required of believers. Sometimes people appeal to uh, Abraham and Jacob giving tithes. They gave 10% on occasions in their life, Abraham to Melchizedek. Uh, Jacob, when God met him at Bethel, promised to give 10%. But those are one-time temporary events. There's no indication that this is something they regularly did, nor is there any command, universal command given to believers uh, from those passages. It gets even more complex. Jesus commands tithing in Matthew. So some people look at that passage and say, look, Jesus commands tithing. But we have to be careful there. Jesus also commands forgiving your brother before you offer a sacrifice at the altar in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus spoke to his contemporaries. Jesus lived himself under the Mosaic law because that covenant was in force until after his ministry, death, and resurrection. So Jesus commending tithing when he's speaking to the Pharisees is no indication that it's still in force today. We always have to think when we read a passage in scripture, where is this in the Bible? So what does the New Testament emphasize? It emphasizes 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, sacrificial, generous giving. For most of us, that's 10% at least or more. However, I still am hesitant to give any particular percent. Sacrificial, generous giving. I would say for virtually everyone, if you're one or two percent, that's not sacrificial, generous giving, is it? (laughs) So God calls upon us to give sacrificially, but we want to heed what the scripture says and to say to believers in Jesus Christ that we're to give 10 percent. Well, I don't think that's in accord with the scriptures. One other point. Actually, when we read the Old Testament, this is a very difficult question. They gave more than 10 percent. There are several ties. And, and sorting that all out, I tried to sort it out once. I didn't spend oodles of time on it, but I tried to sort it out. It's really hard to know how much they gave, but it's probably somewhere in the 20 percentile range. So the tithe, you know, we say 10% today. That's our tradition. But the tithe, when you add up all the different tithes, the tithe is somewhere in the 20% range. So when, if we're really going to tithe according to the Old Testament, It's not 10%, it's somewhere around 20. And uh, as I said, we're not under that covenant. We're not required to tithe today. But we have the opportunity, right, the joy of giving sacrificially and generously. Don't take this answer as an invitation to say, oh, I, I don't have to give generously. I can keep my money for myself. God calls upon each one of us to be generous, sacrificial givers. He tells us that will increase your joy. We are going to be talking today about tithes or tithes and offerings and the commands, New Testament commands mm-hmm. for generosity and giving. The first thing I want to say right off the bat is that this is a hotly debated topic that can sometimes get a little controversial, but here's the deal right off the top. Demanding that people give 10%, mm-hmm. commanding them to do that and saying they're robbing God if they don't is absolutely false. It is unbiblical. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell New Testament Christians Mm -hmm. that they have to give 10%. Now, let me back that up. Malachi 3 verses 8 to 10, typical offering sermon would be, you know, will a man rob God? Mm -hmm. Uh, How have we robbed you? 
Well, you've robbed me in your tithes and offerings. You're not giving a tithe or what means a tenth, 10% of Mm -hmm. all you have. Uh, So bring it all into the storehouse. Stop robbing God. And then if you do stop robbing God, he's going to unload the riches of heaven on your life. That'd be a typical, you know, type of thing you'll hear. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the deal. Uh, In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the tithe, scholars have surmised this uh, rather certainly, actually, so they're not even (laughs) surmising, they know this, is at least 20%. Some scholars argue 30% when Mm -hmm. you add up all the offerings and the different type of things that Israel had to give. Another thing is the priesthood at that time couldn't own land. And so this was a way that they would be supportive. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the theocracy of God's government, if you will, this was a taxation system. Mm -hmm. And uh, also it was food, like grain, and it was livestock and vegetables and what have you. And so all of that is clear. However, let's go a little further. Uh, The storehouse typically taught now as the church or even the pastor's bank account, (laughs) uh, insisting that 10% tithe is law, but leaving out all the other Old Testament laws Mm -hmm. that I guess we should be doing as well if we're supposed to be tithing, uh, that it's a command for churchgoers and they need to be giving 10% of all their gross income. And then often people will say, you know, when you give a tithe, when you give a tithe and then you give an extra offering on top of your tithes, you're really tapping into that extra anointing, Mm -hmm. the extra blessing. And so on and on and on it goes. I want to pass the ball over to Kyle and get us into the New Covenant, into the New Testament, because at best, the idea that 10% is commanded is well-intentioned, principle-based, mm. people just trying to use an Old Testament principle, and, and some poor hermeneutics they haven't been taught. Mm. At worst, it is manipulating people so that they give a base amount so that you can guarantee the church budget will mm. at least have 10% of everybody's pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, help us understand the New Covenant, New Testament giving, and beyond. So this is a great discussion for our church, and I think you've made some great points and some interesting uh, uh, distinctions between how the text can be misused. Because we have two different issues here, either bad hermeneutics, a misunderstanding of how to apply the Old Testament, like this passage from Malachi that you talked about, or... Uh, just ill intentions that mm-hmm. a pastor is going to manipulate his audience in order to increase his bank account, yeah. or at least the church's bank account. Yeah. And we don't want to assume, assume the worst about people, but these things both do happen. So uh, what's important for Christian preachers and what's important for Christians to understand is there is a difference between living under the old covenant versus living under the new covenant. And Jesus clarified this quite well in his ministry when he summed it up by saying, I have come, you, you've basically been in forcing the letter of the law, and, mm-hmm. and, and it's more important to understand the spirit of the law. He said this over and over to Pharisees when he's talking about lust and talking about adultery mm-hmm. and all of these different things. So the idea of the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law, the letter of the law being the Old Testament, Old Covenant life, and the spirit of the law being the, the idea that, that God has, has been generous with us and we are to be generous in return, mm. uh, is spelled out clearly for us in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Yeah. It's good. So when we look at that and we look at the uh, Paul's encouragement to give generously, that's the principle here when he talks about the churches in Macedonia uh, under severe affliction, but yet with abundance and joy mm. and in their extreme poverty. poverty that's yeah. so good. Having overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means. And I can testify beyond their means. Yeah. Of their own accord. Nobody, it wasn't under compulsion. They wanted to. They wanted to. They were begging for these opportunities. It says even for verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Because Mm. they understood, rightly so, that when you give joyfully and and cheerfully to the Lord and to the work of his ministry, that the Lord will multiply that blessing, whether it be to them or whether it be to the saints and brothers that are in need. Okay, so let me jump in real Mm. quick. Um, So what you're saying is it's okay in the New Covenant for there to be different levels of giving, different percentages. You may have wealthy people who, like 1 Timothy 6, they're they're rich and they're instructed to be rich in good works, generous, ready to share, like Paul says. And they could give 50, 60 percent of their income, and and they're still living very well and enjoying life. And you could have people in tough seasons in poverty giving, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4 percent of their Mm -hmm. income, and and that's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that that is okay in the new covenant, that the Lord is working through those who have and those who have not? And 
our hearts just need to be motivated towards generosity. That's mm-hmm. the most important thing. Yeah, I would say that is the most important thing. I mean, Jesus uh, mentioned over and over that it's not about the letter of the law. It's about the spirit. It's about the heart of the worshiper. And so in this case, if you have somebody who has millions of dollars extra in their bank account and it's just sort of a pad there and they can do whatever they want with their money, that's fine. The pastors are not telling you you have to give it all or you should give it all. What we're saying is go before the Lord and ask, is it sacrificial for me to give the amount that I've been giving or has he blessed me to give more? Mm. And for those people who are in a season of life where uh, the finances are a little tighter, say somebody's out of work, say somebody is struggling to pay down some debt, maybe it's wiser to put that money uh, Mm. aside for those lean seasons. And the Lord understands that in that season, he's providing enough for them to get through, but he's not burdening them with a tax. And I've seen some of those abuses. You have too, where, you know, a statement that could be actually a good one. Like Mm -hmm. someone says, you know, I can't afford to give. And you say, you can't afford not to give. (laughs) What are you saying? I mean, if you're saying you can't afford not to give, meaning you want to experience the joy of giving. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you can't be really experiencing the fullness of the Christian life without, you know, being generous towards someone else in any way, shape, or could be small or big. So there's that. But what most of the time guys mean is, you know, you can't afford not to give, you know, test God, right? Just like, and they go back to Malachi Mm -hmm. 3 and, you know, I can't afford not to give, you know, I'm blessed, I'm giving, and and that is where the abuses come in, right? To what you're saying, it becomes this compulsory, manipulative Mm -hmm. demand. Yeah, and it's also ignoring the other texts in the New Testament, like Galatians 6, where we're called to bear each other's burdens. There are seasons where people go through burdens. That's really good. And if they're burdened heavily financially, we should not burden them further by saying, you need to support the work of the ministry right now faithfully or God's not going to bless you. Now, the principle still stands in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. the, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But this is an issue of the heart. Mm. If you sow sparingly thinking, well, I'm going to keep what's mine and I'll give a little bit to the Lord. All you're going to see is that tiny little seed be put to work and turned into something that's a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the Lord will work faithfully with that. But what God is promising here is that if you give joyfully out of a out of a position of blessing and out of a desire to see others served the more so that you can do that and the more you're faithful to do that with whatever God has blessed you with you're going to see that infinitely return. And that doesn't Not just mean... to you, sorry. Not no, just yeah. to you, but also to the church around you. So you witness yeah. the blessings to everyone else. It's not about us. It's about caring for and loving the body and yeah. serving the Lord. I love that. And just to be clear, too, you're not saying that, oh, if you give bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully, and that means stuff. Stuff. It's like, not man, stuff. I'm going to give a whole bunch of money, and God's going to get like the old hundred-fold hundred fold, you know, return. <laughs> exactly. This is... The joy of the participating ch- in the gospel. This is even seeing, for example, uh, you know, if we were to give a, a, a large check to an international organization mm-hmm. overseas, and they send you know fifteen men to seminary training because of that, that's a bountiful harvest. Amen. That's good if we are able to sow bountifully. Yep. So you're not talking about oh, I'm going to get a, a you know. 10 times bigger house if I give a 10 times bigger offering. No. You're talking about planting uh, seeds in the ground, so to speak, mm-hmm. real good, faithful, sound doctrine mm-hmm. kind of soil, and then seeing God produce spiritual harvest mm-hmm. and me and you and all of us getting the joy of participation. Yep. And awesome. watching watching it happen in the lives of others, uh, see them receive what they need in order to be blessed by the Lord and just being able to be an instrument in the Lord's hands taking Love part that. in that. Love that. So to summarize, uh, do your homework on the tithe. Mm. Do your homework on what all those offerings were. Uh, and also take the heart of Second Corinthians 8, 9. When Paul says in the chapters that we've been talking about that Jesus became poor so we could become rich, what he's talking about is the lavish pouring out of the grace of God. Mm. He he emptied himself of all that he could have had so that you and I could have mm. uh, a sinless future in heaven, a purification of sin, mm. glorification one day in glory. Mm. He was lavish and generous with grace as a model for our generosity here and now mm-hmm. to one another and for the gospel. So Amen. that's the heart of giving. And uh, we'll put some links in the bottom of this video if you want to look at some articles or check out more. But uh, don't feel burdened to tithe, but do feel a burden in the right way, in a good way, to joyfully participate. Mm. Feel a conviction to say, I get to give. 
I get to serve the Lord in this way and be generous as he provides. Yeah, I get to give. That's the key right there. I get, I to, get give. to give to the Lord. Right, well, anyway, so the very first thing that we're going to talk about is tithe was established before the law. That's something that is always brought up to, the, to those who, who really hold that tithe is for New Testament believers. So tithe is before the law. Uh, then uh, tithe is explained by the law. Uh, third, a uh, tithe is affirmed by Christ. And point number four is kind of a, a, a summation of those three things, that if it existed before the law, it was explained in the law, and then is affirmed by Christ after the law, uh, thus, uh, and it is not, it is not uh, condemned by any of the uh, New Testament authors, then uh, this is a moral law. So we'll, we'll grapple with that as well. Uh, uh, number five, uh, we should not steal from God. We'll t- tackle the Malachi text. Uh, and then grace calls us to a higher standard. That, that tithe is the minimum because it's in the law. And now that we have grace, it's calling us to do more. So these are a lot of the, the arguments that I hear around the tithe conversation. This tithe was established before the law. So um, this argument suggests that if something was established before the law, uh, then it has at least the opportunity to transcend the law and still be in effect. Um, one of the things that I would like to bring to attention is that there's tons of things that were um, around that were being practiced before the law uh, that are not applicable for New Testament believers. For example, circumcision, right? The book of Galatians talks about circumcision. The book of Romans speaks of this as well, right? Like when was Abraham justified? Was it before or was it after circumcision? No, Abraham was deemed righteous. And then chapters later, then he is given the mark of circumcision as a sign, a part of the covenant. But he was deemed righteous before circumcision. And this is the argument that Paul gives in Galatians. And in Galatians, he's like, hey, there are those who want to come in and require circumcision for you New Testament Gentiles. And he goes, I wish those guys would emasculate themselves entirely. Um, So pretty strong language. I'm only suggesting that if something existed before the law, it doesn't give it some kind of um, transcendent authority to to be applicable for all New Testament believers. Because in Genesis chapter 14, 23 through 24 that we read, Abraham didn't give 10%. He gave 10% to Melchizedek. Uh, but he gave 100%. He gave everything. He went and fought in battle, came back, 10% went to Melchizedek, but then 90% went to the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. If we're going to make the suggestion that because Abraham gave 10% of his income to uh, a righteous priest, right, a righteous king, um, and then gave 90% of his income to unrighteous kings that God would soon destroy— um, it would it would it would no more affirm tithe than it would socialism. Secondly, tithe uh, was given one time in Abraham's life. There's no evidence that Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek before this event, or that Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek after this event. Uh, the second point that is often cited by those who say that, that tithe is required for New Testament believers that we, we mentioned earlier was that it was explained in the law. Well, well, specifically, we read Leviticus chapter 27, uh, 30 through 33. Now, there, there are multiple passages in, in Deuteronomy and uh, in the Torah that talk about tithe and the different practices of tithe, uh, but I would just have you pay close attention to the very first verse, 2730 of Leviticus, right? Uh, Every tithe of the land. It's interesting. What is the land? Who's, uh, uh, whatever seed is of the land or of the fruit of the trees. What is of the land? It's talking about the nation of Israel, right? He's talking about the nation of Israel. God is going to pour out blessing on the nation of Israel. Uh, they're going to, to create, there's going to there's gonna be seed and harvest that's going to come from God's prosperous favor upon them. And then they're going to give 10% to the Levitical priest, this is really important. There's context to the use of tithe in the Old Testament. It's not like God was just saying, hey guys, I really want to, to test all of you, and I, I, I want to make sure that you're you know, giving 10% to me. Like God doesn't have a mouth, right? We're not feeding God, and all of that was being given in tithe in the Levitical era uh, was seed and grain and fruit. Why were they giving this? Well, there was 12 tribes. Uh, I'm saying 12 tribes pretty intentionally. Well, I guess there were two half-tribes. So there's 12 tribes, including the half-tribes, that are giving to who? 
the Levitical priests because the Levitical priests were not allowed to have a portion of land in the nation of Israel. And all, all the different tribes have their, their plot of land, and Levi, uh, they're given the Lord's portion. They're to tend to the tabernacle. They're not allowed to have land. They're not allowed to grow harvest or crops. So the nations of Israel would give 10% of what they had to uh, the priest to eat. Later on, we would also see uh, in uh, the, the 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 covenant that was given to the children of Israel, specifically to the children of Israel, uh, that they uh, they would give uh, a tithe not just for the Levitical priests, but also for the festivals. There was a festival tithe. In addition to that, there was another tithe for the widows and the orphans and those who were poor. So there's actually three separate tithes that are mentioned. This is a judicial system. It's a nation. And of this nation, there was a religious sect, if you will, that was established within that nation. They're, they're just one whole cohesive piece. And as a nation, would taxed. They were taxed as a nation to take care of widows and orphans and part of their religious system. It was all one cohesive unit. So the tithe, uh, as it was being given, was for that, for the care of of the Levitical priest for the widows and the orphans and the required festivals that God uh, commanded of the children of Israel. Point number three, uh, tithe is affirmed by the law, during the law, and by Christ. We need to talk about Christ first. So the first, the third point was that that Jesus affirmed the law, right? I, I skipped one point. Uh, so in Matthew chapter 23, tw- uh, 23, we read this passage together. Woe to you, scribes and you Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You're tithing mint and cumin, but you're neglecting weighty matters of the law. Now, Jesus was born under the law, and Jesus fulfilled the law. So when people were coming to him, asking him questions, he would respond rightfully, not to tell them to rebel against the law, because the law was still in effect. It had not yet been fulfilled. So Christ, he's coming along, and he's, he's teaching them to do the very thing that a teacher of the law would do, compelling them to follow it. He says, you tithe mint and cumin, right? Again, food, not money. You tithe mint and cumin, and uh, you, you neglect mercy and justice, and, and you should not neglect the weightier matters of the law, but the former and the latter, you should do them both, right? So here we go. Uh, uh, Jesus is actually calling these things law, of which I believe are to be fulfilled. And talking prior about what kind of law, Christians have divided tithe. Well, not Christians have divided tithe. Christians have divided the law and typically into three different categories. Judicial law, uh, we'll have the ceremonial law, and we'll have the moral law. The judicial law would be like, hey, if you steal this, we're chopping off your hand. Uh, the ceremonial law would be, these are the things and the kinds of offerings that you bring unto the Lord. And then the moral law is going to be, uh, uh, hey, this is bad for all people everywhere. You'll see God judging nations because they've broken the moral law. God may destroy a nation for sexual immorality or neglect for the poor. Uh, God may uh, destroy a nation because of their wickedness and idolatry and witchcraft. But uh, we don't see God destroying a nation because they're not giving a tenth of their income. Uh, We don't see uh, God speaking to the tithe as it's moral, but because it was built into uh, the judicial system and the, the, the ceremonial system, we can, I think we can assume that this is done away with. That being said, I have theonomist brothers who believe that the judicial law should still be in effect, and for them, I think the tithe is a kind of a more difficult conversation. So this moves us into point number four. Because it was mentioned in the before the law, it was mentioned in the law, and that Christ affirmed it, therefore it is a moral or transcendent law, um, maybe part of the created order. Uh, this is something, uh, I just don't think this argument holds water. I mean, it's really clever, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, um, uh, condescend. It's it's like a really interesting um, teaching, uh, and I think that it's it sounds really compelling. Uh, you know, hey, if it's mentioned before the law, in the law, Christ affirms it, and the apostles don't condemn it, then we should still do it, right? Well, if you if you take in other laws of to that same nature, um, I think you'll find that that argument doesn't hold water. So let's let's try to find another law or another practice that was practiced before the law, uh, was described in the law, n- not condemned, but brought up by Jesus, and then not condemned by any of the apostles. Um, this is called, uh, it's kind of hard to say, liveret marriage. I don't know if you're familiar with this, uh, but this is the idea that if you have a brother, and your brother gets married, and your brother's not able to raise up a son, and your brother dies, you are responsible for taking his wife 
impregnating his wife and raising up an heir for your brother so that your wife and son can, can assume the estate that the father had left, right? Um, this is talked about before the law in Genesis chapter 38, 1 through 30. Uh, this is explained in the law in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, and is brought before Jesus in Matthew uh, 22, 23 through 34. Uh, the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, come to Jesus trying to trip him up, trying to trick him, and they say, Jesus, this man uh, has his brother's wife because his brother passed, and then he dies, and then the other brother marries her, and seven times this goes down the line where every brother marries this woman, and they aren't able to uh, uh, to raise up a son, and, and all these people go to heaven. Who is this woman married to in the New Jerusalem? And Jesus responds, oh, well, uh, there's no marriage or giving in marriage in heaven. But what Jesus doesn't say, what Jesus doesn't say, just like the tithe conversation, Jesus doesn't go, hey, no, no, you shouldn't tithe. That's not a part of the New Testament covenant. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, guys, uh, uh, this whole marriage system of passing uh, your brother's wife to the next brother in line, uh, that, that's not for today. Jesus just goes along with it and says, no, no, that's not the way it works in heaven. To no surprise, none of the New Testament apostles condemn this practice. So this is a practice that existed before the law. Seems pretty moral. God kills a guy for not doing it. Then it takes place in the Levitical law, it's commanded, and then Jesus brings it up, and he doesn't condemn it, and neither do any of the New Testament apostles. Uh, number five, uh, the, the author of Hebrew affirms it. We don't have time to address this one, I don't think. Um, Malachi, let's talk about Malachi, okay? What are tithes, and what are these offerings, right? What are these that are being given to the Lord? Well, offerings, some will say tithe is 10%. It's the minimum, and offerings is above and beyond that. It's not what the Bible says. The tithes and, and offerings are the wave offering, the grain offering, the wine offering. These are additional offerings that are brought before the Lord that are explained in the covenant. Nowhere in the Bible is tithe 10% of your financial income of dollars and cents. Uh, it's specifically the produce of Israel and your offerings are additional acts of ceremonial worship, okay? And then he says, you've robbed me in your tithes and contributions, okay? And then he talks about, so that what? There may be food in my storehouse. Again, this is a food. This is a storehouse for the Levitical priests, right? Okay, my, my argumentation in this is not to say you shouldn't give to the church. And unfortunately, because of the conversation and the heatedness of the conversation and the way that money is being talked about in the church by the world and by Christians, uh, we've really militarized this conversation. Um, I believe that you should give and you should give generously, and you should give abundantly. And I think you should give without compulsion. Uh, and this is what the New Testament tells us. And, and what does it look to give without compulsion? Well, when Moses asked the people, hey, give to the tabernacle, to the building of the Lord. Look at this God who's delivered you. Would you give as your heart compels you? In that passage, Moses tells the people, stop giving. Stop giving gold. Stop giving silver. Stop giving us the myrrh and the frankincense and all the things that are necessary for the production of this wonderful tabernacle. We have to much. What happens in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit is poured out? What's the very first thing that the church does? They give all that they have and lay it at the apostles' feet. A heart of generosity is produced by a leading of the Spirit. The man so let's take a look at what the Bible says, what it really says about giving tithe. Why do some people say that we have to give 10% to the church? Tithing. Well, it comes from the Old Testament. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So yes, the Old Testament law did require people to tithe. But it wasn't just 10%. And it wasn't just one tithing, but multiple tithes. Deuteronomy 14 verse 29 talks about for the poor people. And Numbers 18, verse 21, and also 26, and then also 2 Chronicles 31, verse 45, talks about tithing to the Levites. And then also for the temple and the feasts in Deuteronomy 12, verse 5 to 6, and in Nehemiah 10, verse 35. Now, if you really want to work it out, it's actually more than 20%. Because remember, it's for the Levites, the temple, for the poor, for the feasts, and those kind of things. But... When we look at the New Testament, it doesn't say anything about a certain percentage or money that we have to give to God. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. 
and you are not required to give exactly 10% or over 20% to God, but you should be led by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Can, can, can I just explain to viewers that, that Russell um, is actually registered as legally blind and therefore if he's picking up and hiding himself behind his papers, it's not because he doesn't want you to see his face, uh, but obviously he wants to, uh, to read his notes. But just so you've got freedom to do that and be at rest. Russell, thank you very much and your 10 minutes starts now. Okay, I'd like to start with something that's a little bit awkward. I've looked in English history and I found a list of very famous Englishmen uh, who agree with me that tithing should not be taught in the churches. And I think this might be a shock to a lot of Englishmen. Uh, beginning with John Wycliffe, uh, John Smythe, John Milton, Oliver Cromwell, John Bunyan, the Quakers, John Gill, Adam Clark, Charles Spurgeon, I think you've heard that name, and G. Campbell Morgan. <laughs> so... Uh, my viewpoint is not new. It's not, you know, it's not something that I'm, a, that I should be accused of being a heretic for saying because many have followed me. Oh, I forgot the, uh, the biggest two names of this list. They're not Englishmen, though. A man named Martin Luther and a gentleman named John Calvin. All opposed tithing at, uh, for the church. They said it's not for the church. Okay, my first point uh, is that I'm not against church support. A lot of people confuse tithes and offerings. I'm fully for supporting the gospel. But when, when I'm for it, I'm for it because the New Testament uh, giving principles given to us by the Holy Spirit and blessed by the Holy Spirit are first of all free will. They're generous and they're especially sacrificial. They're joyful. Uh, they're not by commandment. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. They are motivated by love for God and love for man. And I am convinced that if the church was to get back to these New Testament given principles, blessed by the Holy Spirit, that we would see a revival. Uh, there are too many people, uh, our brother just, uh, has already made it clear he doesn't agree with the position that says uh, we shouldn't teach tithing by a curse and by threatening people. I'm glad he takes that position because I'm very much... I agree with them there. But there are many people across the UK and the and US and everywhere else that are afraid to come to church. They're embarrassed to come to church. Uh, they, they think that if they come to church, they're going to go home being cursed because they have not to tithe. They go home because they feel inadequate. They've, they've been meant to feel uh, unwelcome because they can't put so much in the offering plate. So I am forgiving. But I think the word tithe should be replaced by the word sacrificial giving. Uh, the reason I say that, and I said this on CBS News a couple of years ago, uh, I make a statement that is a bold, daring statement that not one single thing taught by the church today concerning tithing is biblical. I know you don't like that, but <laughs> let me say it again. Just not it. one single thing taught by the church concerning tithing today is biblical. Now I'll go back to the definition of tithing. There are 16 texts in the Word of God that define the contents of the tithe. And in each text, the tithe is always only food from God's holy land of Israel, which God has miraculously increased by His own hand. Uh, the biblical tithes could not come from what man produced. They could not come from uh, what man increased. They could not come from Gentiles. And especially they could not come from outside the Holy Land of Israel. Now I stand by that definition and in 10 years I've, had, I've yet to have anybody prove me that that definition is incorrect. So right off the bat, the definition everybody uses for tithing I believe is wrong. But then the argument comes up, well, they didn't have money in those days. Therefore, the tithe was barter. You, you traded food for items. Uh, the book of Genesis alone contains the word money 32 times. 
The word money occurs 44 times before the tithing occurs in Leviticus 27. So money was very common in the Old Testament. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, money was required for sanctuary service. If you were to bring a vow, if you was to uh, pay a fine, uh, if you were to pay the shekel, the head tax, uh, even slaves bought their freedom with money. So, so money was required by, from, if money was required in the sanctuary service, then I asked, then why was money never included in any definition of tithing in the Old Testament? We, we'll probably go round and round with, with Genesis 14 and Abraham. What Abram tithed uh, was not a holy tithe. It was from pagan spoils of war, which he had gathered from those who had sacked Sodom and Gomorrah. This is new to a lot of people. The law of the land required that tithes of, of spoils of war be brought to your local king priest. And therefore, Abraham was not ob obeying a command of God. I suggest he was obeying the, the common law of the land, and that can be proven by many, many sources. But Abraham was the father of faith. Yes, but not everything Abraham did was, as, was motivated by faith. Uh, we say we should give the tithe because Abraham gave 10%. Well, uh, what do we do with this when we say Abraham gave the 90% to the king of Sodom? I'm following Abraham's example. So uh, how far do we go with Abraham's example as a, as a father of faith? We should begin our level of giving at 10%. Sounds good. It's a good place to start. It's the good training wheels. As Randy Alcorn says and many others say, it's a great place to start. It really sounds good. 10% is a good place to start. But think about this. In the Bible, 10% was only a minimum standard beginning place of giving for food producers who lived inside Israel. If you were a Jew living outside Israel, you could not tithe at all. If you were a Gentile, you could not tithe at all. If you were a carpenter like Jesus or a tent maker like Paul, or a, or a fisherman like Peter, you could not tithe at all because what you produced was not the increase that God had miraculously increased from his holy land. Therefore, uh, when we, we talk about tithe, we, we completely ignore the biblical definition. We redefine it, and we use it for our own purposes. So what I like about people who are, I not say anti-tithing, but more for grace giving, they typically used Bible texts in context to support their argument. Often people who support tithing in the affirmative they may more or less do stories, add, you know, ad hominem ideas, tell testimonies and things of that, but they don't skip they don't stick to the scriptures for the most part. A lot of them will stick with Malachi three verses eight through eleven or twelve a lot of a lot of times. But they rarely go into the Deuteronomy 14, Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 26, uh, Numbers 18, or Nehemiah 10 and 13, where often the people on the other side of the the, uh, the other side of the argument do. So the first person that talked was Francis Chan, super popular uh, Christian. He um, he was more of a day, you know, kind of like he just doesn't think that applies for today more from a legal perspective. And it's a, you know, if you've heard him speak before or read his books, typical delivery for him, right? Then you go to John MacArthur, and MacArthur is probably one of my favorite authors in Christendom. Christendom. I love his, The Gospel According to Jesus, The Gospel According to Paul, The Gospel According to God. He is a fantastic Bible teacher, and we disagree on a lot of things. Obviously, he's way more... <laughs> Way, way more popular than I am and ha has a bigger following, but I can still disagree. You know, I don't believe in the, you know, they're, they're, you, people can still be wrong. But in this case, we we come to the same conclusion. He's a proof positive that when you do, when you support and embrace grace giving, it absolutely works in the body of Christ. And so then we go into Mike Winger. Now, Mike Winger has a very popular YouTube channel, and, and, and the links to all these full videos will be in the, um, in the notes to this, to this, so you can watch it all in context, so you don't think I'm just slicing and dicing to prove my point. But Mike Winger, he had a, a couple really good comments, I thought, there. The question about tithing for a couple who are split, one's a believer, one's a not believer, or one doesn't agree and one does agree, his answer, I thought, was really good. It's, it's a challenging situation. I've heard this argument before or heard this concern before. And 
uh, regrettably, it's it's often the the wife wants to tithe and or wants to give ten percent or a certain amount, and the husband does not. Um, very rarely it's the other way around. But I'm telling you, you get husband saves, things can become a lot easier. And I this is just a this is nothing to do with tithing at all. But churches need to do a better job of welcoming 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 men into their fellowship. But churches by and large are very feminine in nature and it's it's difficult it's off-putting to men and a lot of pastors men pastors kind of denigrate men from the pulpit they think that there's it's an easy easy thing to do because we've been punching bags for so long but i'm telling you if you want your life to be easier for families make it easier for the men in your church and that's not lowering the bar because most men don't want you to lower the bar but they just want to be treated with respect and dignity, and they want to be men. They don't want to be like men who had to pretend they like women because we don't do that, right? So, but uh, Winger answered that question very well. And I thought his, uh, his, it was kind of a funny thing about Elon Musk coming to a church and having to give a billion dollars or whatever number he picked. But that's a true statement. I mean, so many churches need to get their finances in order, and they're waiting for this windfall. I, I remember hearing a pastor one time uh, said if everybody in the church would tithe, then we could end world hunger. And that sounds great, but it's untrue. And it's just a someone making a statement just off the cuff because I think it sounds good and someone else repeats it and it gets more steam and more traction. But the truth is, if you have a lot of money and you're not, if you're not feeding the hungry right now, the poor in your community now with what you do have, you're not going to do it when you get a windfall. So stop, just stop it and, and find a way to manage your money and balance your books and push the envelope and do great things locally and globally with what you have. You don't have to turn the world upside down single-handedly, but you can make a difference with where you are. I'll just give you an example where I work, and I work for a secular company. But people want to, people in the, for the most part are generous, and not everyone goes to church. So one of the things I introduced when, when, I, came into, when I came into this company was a, something we did when I lived in Illinois at the church. We called it Minute Mission, and we would just pick one single item and collect it once a month and deliver it to a shelter. So we found a local emergency shelter in this area now and talked to them. And they're accustomed to people coming in and l lending a hand at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but they don't get a whole lot of support, support year-round, long-term relationships. So we went there, sent some people in there, a team to talk to the director, ask what kind of items they need. They gave us a list. And so once a month, the team decides what we're gonna collect. So like it may be something simple as paper plates, you know, plastic forks and knives and cups. And so people in the company, in my company, will come in. They'll go when they're getting their groceries. They'll buy, a, you know, a box of paper plates or a box of a container of napkins or whatever. And then once a month, we make that delivery. So it's w doing what we can do. Is it going to change the whole world? No. But it might change a couple people's lives. And sometimes that's what you have to understand is you only do what you can do. And so churches, do what you can do where you are. Stop waiting for the Elon Musk's or the Bill Gates of the world to drop a billion in your, in your bucket or whatever it is and be a good steward where you are. Next one was Todd Friedel from Wretched Radio. And he seemed to be really close to the John MacArthur style of interpretation of this, that the tithe was primarily a tax for a theocracy, which I understand. I look at it a little differently because they were never tithing money. They were only tithing food. So it was kind of like a tax, but not. Um, again, we get to the same conclusion at the end. We just kind of take different steps to get there. But I thought he had some really good points, especially... Should you give when you're in debt? Man, he took a hardcore stance on that, and I truly appreciated that. That's so good that he is using that, his 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 pulpit, so to speak, to understand that. Because I, I've heard it said too many times from pastors that you can give your way out of debt, you cannot give God, and all these cliches that mean absolutely nothing and have no script, scriptural backing. I mean, do you really want, I mean, Friel was really strong and says, you know, you're not giving God money. You're giving, you're stealing from somebody else to give to God. And that's not what God has. And too often in the church, we're just trying to nickel and dime people to get them in a groove of giving. But we rarely help them become strong stewards with their resources where they can actually expand their income and minimize their expenses and reduce their debt load. And then there's more margin to give. It's like we just can't think that way. Even evangelical 
evangelical churches, Southern Baptist churches, some Presbyterians that are hardcore anti-prosperity gospel have let the prosperity gospel seep into their thinking when they say stuff like, you can't get out, I'll give God. I don't know. I just gave and more came in. Well, how so? How so? And it's kind of weird thinking. It's almost like, you know, I, I can't like spiritual voodoo sometimes. Basically, we have to work and we earn money and we have to pay our bills, pay down debt, invest and save and give. You know, that's what we can do. Money's not going to show up on your front door from UPS or FedEx because God decided to drop a billion in your, in, your, in your bank account, right? So let's stop thinking that way. But Todd Friedel, fantastic job where he explained that we shouldn't even give while we're in debt. That's, that's super powerful. The next person was Dr. Thomas Schreiner, um, and he did a really good job of explaining things from a, uh, a academic perspective of the tithe, and I thought he did a good job. But what I really appreciated most about his, though, he said up front that you know, really strong Christians, smart people disagree, with, disagree on this subject. It's not the clearest, and I, I would have a tendency to agree with that. Now, all my desire is is for people to, the people on the tithing side, is to actually support the idea and use scripture to back up their idea and not just accolades and stories and testimonies, but actually use the text, right? So, but nice job from Thomas Schreiner. I thought he added, his, his input was fantastic and truly appreciated. And then Costi Hinn and Kyle Swanson from Redeemer Bible Church in Arizona. Now, Costi Hinn has a strong relation to this because he was raised in the prosperity gospel where they believe his uncle was Benny Hen. So he's really strong on this stuff. And I thought their take was super solid too. Great to see that there are some churches out there that are, you know, expecting scripture, using scripture to make their point. And that was really appreciated. Um, yeah, so that was fantastic how they talked about that. And they used the the Second Corinthians uh the eight and nine where Jesus became poor and discussed that topic very well. And then uh, Josh from the Remnant Radio, Josh Lewis, Joshua Lewis from the Remnant Radio, his his take on this, he he went through all the different um, exceptions. People say we should we should tithe because of X and Y and Z. And I thought he did a really fantastic job. I remember when I heard this video, his video a long time ago when it first came out, my wife's like, you'd like this. And because I believe I'm sometimes I feel alone talking about tithing because so many people disagree with how I think about it and it become it can become a, an argumentative thing and that's not what I'm trying to do. And she says, hey, I think you'd like this guy. He talked about tithing and I just like, oh, here we go again. Another person talking about tithing. And but he's one of the few I heard that and not not that you had to agree with anything I say, but sometimes it's, you feel lonely when you have a certain perspective of it. And we agreed pretty much lockstep on everything. And he did a great job of explaining it. So I really encourage you um, listen to, listen to that whole video of his because the whole thing is is super fantastic. And then Daniel uh, Merritt's from DLM Christian Lifestyle. I, I wasn't familiar with him. He did the same thing. He very close to what Josh said, just a different way of hearing it, different way of doing it. And again, he added super good content to this. And it's nice to know that there's other people out there reaching people with truth because this is what's the thing about tithing for real is it's about truth. Sometimes we just say, well, what's people? What what is your end game here? Why do you why do you want to talk about this? Do you want people not to give? And that's never the case. I just I love truth, and forcing people to give or persuading people to give or strong arming them to give with Bible texts that just do not align with Bible is is you know it's, it's problematic. And so it's nice to know there are people out there who are reaching thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, and there's more people out there. My goal is hopefully one day we can get beyond this whole concept of ridiculousness, and it's going to be like the equality scripture in Second Corinthians 8, 13, and 14, because there's sometimes when people who have money don't have money, and those who do have money can give, and we, we're not always trying to think, oh, I can't give this week, so I must be going to hell because I'm not tithing and I'm a thief. That's not the case. That there's equality. I mean, yeah, it's not socialism, not communism, not fascism. It's Christianity. And then finally, Russell Kelly. Now, Russell Kelly and David Croto are probably the two of the most fantastic people when it comes to understanding the tithe. Kelly did his doctoral thesis, dissertation, 
on tithing many years ago and wrote a book called Should the Tur Church Teach Tithing? Highly recommend his stuff. He has a ton of free stuff on his website. I think it's called Russell Kelly Tithing, or I'll put a link into the, the show notes. But his book is really good. It's, it's, it's not a coloring book. There is some, there is some, some deep subjects in there. And, and for me, I've read it a couple times. I'm still trying to grind through the, the uh, Hebrew 7 and 8 stuff. Don't quite understand that stuff still. But he has been super beneficial um, in the tithing community and being truthful. And I'm sure he's taken a lot of abuse um, because of his stance on it, but uh, he's helped a lot of people. And hopefully we can get to the point someday where we're beyond just the idea of nickel and diming the church. Because what's tr truthful is what's do being done now by the people who teach tithing is not working. Because statistically speaking, you it, you get different numbers. Some say 2 3 4% of the people in the church tithe. And we are not reaching and growing things in the kingdom like we used to. And um, I, I'm writing a wrote a book, and it's with editors right now. But there's one of the things I talk about is how in Christianity we Christians started Rutgers and Harvard and Yale and Princeton, Boston College, Notre Dame, Grove City College, Biola, you know, um, Wheaton, all these great colleges that were great at one time specifically. Um, were started by Christians, and the hospital system was a mercy and grace gift that, we, that Christians introduced to the world. And uh, the Catholics did a great job of separating their school system and designing schools for their children to educate them specifically. And now we can barely just get out of our own way. I mean, the churches consume 78% of their of the donations, contributions for salary and buildings. Our buildings compared to the, the that was built in the 16, 17, 1800s are just kind of ugly compared to them. Our architecture is terrible, and people are stressed out financially, but we're making more money than ever. It, it's, it's, and it's, so the tithing thing's not working. It's not working. We need to get to grace giving, where people are giving just based on what God said. And the, the scripture backs it up in Exodus, I think it's Exodus 25, when they're going to build the tabernacle, God says, take an offering. And I don't want people to give whose heart's committed to it. Then he said the kind of things they needed for the tabernacle. And by five or six chapters later, you know, they're like, we can't take it. There's too much stuff. We have to stop, stop taking offerings. And so I have a, my heart's desire is one day the church will get to that point where we're just giving so much. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not because the people aren't wanting to give. Maybe the churches need to position themselves and do more for reaching the lost and making a difference in the communities. Maybe that's why people aren't giving. Maybe it's a godly thing. I don't know. Just a suggestion. So there you go. Nine people who support who who support grace giving versus the tithe. I hope this video has been a blessing to you. If it has, please like, subscribe, and share. And I will see you soon with a new video. Until then, I dare you to profit so you can practice and promote radical, revolutionary, fearless generosity. Blessings. Mm -hmm.